Welcome to episode 567 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and after a real bummer of a week, nothing too negative came out of this one. That is the good news. Okay, maybe like one or two negative things, of course, but this match review is going to be largely positive. That is a guarantee. We are talking about kids, after all, literal teenagers. So if you want the good and the bad, because again, this is going to be mainly good, subscribe to the YouTube channel or on your podcast app of choice, or you can join the Patreon for the show without the ads. And with that, let's dive into the five headlines from Barcelona's one nothing win over Mallorca. Headline one is Mallorca's slow march to Montjuic. Now, I know there are a lot of complaints about how high it is up that hill, and it seems like Mallorca, at least what was on the field, were a little bit later in terms of energy than Barcelona were to get into this game. There was no Xavi on the touchline, which is interesting for Barcelona. Oscar Hernandez's brother was there instead. And who knows if that helped or hurt? We talked, that being Lavon and I, during the listener question show just about 36 hours ago. So you can go back and listen to that. It was the last podcast on the feed or on the channel. And we talked about Xavi on the sideline a bit there. But again, no Xavi. So Oscar Hernandez, the man in charge. The only other pre-match thing to note is that while he didn't play, I do want to note that Mika Faye got his first call up to the first team. That on the back of rumors that Barcelona turned down close to a 10 million euro offer for him in January. Clearly, they do have plans for him to at least see that he's being and will be incorporated in the first team before too long, which is a good sign. And for more talk on Faye, I send you back now two weeks ago to the show that I did with Kevin Williams, where we had a whole segment about Faye. Let's get this one started because the surprise really was the starting lineup with Mark Yu in the middle. Lewandowski gets a rest for Napoli on Tuesday, which will be a main theme about this, as well as the injuries to all the midfielders, especially. So really one true midfielder in the starting lineup in Gundogan with Mark Yu up top alongside Jao Felix to his left and Lamini Mall on the right with Rafinha being the high right interior, which is something we have seen in limited time. And I believe this is the second start where Xavi has gone with that formation with Rafinha as a midfielder. And even with all those different pieces and chemistry maybe being an issue, it was still a decent start for Barcelona. In the fourth minute, it was a good turn from Gundogan. Felix laid it off for Lamine Mall, and the second action led to a Koundé long shot as well. So I do like taking those long shots early to open up that block a little. We do know that Javier Aguirre, and if you watch their run to the Copa del Rey final, Aguirre has his team pretty well organized. And even though they don't score a ton of goals, they're a team that is set in their ways and organization, and they have ideas together, which is something that we can criticize that Barcelona usually do not have attacking the other way. Seventh minute, Ter Stegen gave it away, his one mil sloppy play of the game. Cancelo and Martinez had him covered, though. But Barca were getting stuck in their own half for a moment there, and Gu had the opportunity to show some strong hold-up play as Barca got across midfield. There wasn't too much to talk about in the first part of that game. Barcelona should have been on the front foot when comparing the two bits of energy from these two teams, and 14th minute, Gundogan another dribble forward, and Cancelo's long shot this time blocked. Mallorca, along with a few late fouls in the early part of the game, they just didn't have, as I said, the same energy that Barcelona did to start the game. But even their defending, as I just complimented, was a bit unorganized, and it was leaving some space for Barcelona to exploit. Unfortunately, in the early parts of the game, like they usually don't, they weren't able to make Mallorca pay. Headline two is Gundogan's gaff. Now, the word gaff might be a bit too harsh, but obviously I was going for a little bit of alliteration on the penalty miss. So 20th minute, exactly the ball Xavi would want Lamine Mall to play. With Rafinha driving forward, Rafinha perfectly picks it up in his path, and he's brought down in the box. Competing with the arm that touched him, and that's what the referee clearly was seeing, that there was the arm, and the arm itself was not enough to have caused the penalty. So VAR, fortunately, looked at this. And maybe this was because Rafinha went down holding his ankle as well. It wasn't just a dive, and contact might have also been made at the ankle. So the VAR with Rafinha on the ground did have a moment to look at it, and it was shown clearly that Capete had took enough out of him, and that is definitely a penalty. So VAR gets it right. That was enough to overturn it, that contact on the ankle. But unfortunately, Gundogan had it saved, and once the keeper guessed right, Rikovic had it easily covered. Perfect height for the keeper to save. For all the good stuff he did early in the game, not the best penalty at all for Gundogan. He also took the penalty from Jao Felix, who was the first one to set himself up for it, and missing it does nothing for morale. But I don't know if Xavi had this sorted out or didn't, if Jao Felix was being a bit too overdramatic with it, and it was always going to be Gundogan with Lewandowski out, because usually Lewandowski is the man. But I hope that Xavi did have this sorted out beforehand, and maybe we're just questioning Jao Felix, him wanting to take the penalty. And I know not all managers do that. They kind of trust their professional players to solve it on the field themselves. But I do at least regardless of the level, prefer when managers have that pre-planned. And until somebody asks about it, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. I want to stick on Gunawan for a minute here and jump now to the 60th minute 
because he had a play then to Gu, who then played the back heel back to him into his path, but the German didn't get enough on it. He also had uncharacteristic giveaways as well, like in the 66th minute. And a number of times in my notes, I don't need to regale all these moments, but it wasn't Gunwan's best game. And I think a large part of that, not to make an excuse for him, but he was really the only natural midfielder on the pitch for Barcelona. Rafinha, obviously a forward. He goes out for Fermin Lopez. Is he a natural midfielder? Not really either. He's kind of this pseudo, I want to say just attacker in that forward slash midfielder role. So the only actual midfielder is Gundogan. And it felt like he was trying to do too much at times with Pedri and De Jong out. He still had Christensen to support him. So his dribble movements, I thought in particular, were still as good as they've been in recent weeks. But in terms of his stop ball stuff, and it just seemed like he was a bit tired in this game and taking too much on his plate. The other big note from the first half is the number of blocks that Mallorca had, as many opponents always have against Barcelona. But it does remind me, in this game especially, of that first season with Coutinho with how many of his shots were blocked. And I just thought that the Barcelona attackers in particular, they weren't throwing enough fakes in, they weren't fainting enough. That's F-E-I-N-T. They weren't disguising stuff well enough, and those shots became way too predictable for Mallorca and the shape that they were in. Headline three is three teenagers and Fermin. 34th minute comes along, Mallorca, they had a counter after Lamini Mall's centering giveaway. Martinez was beaten for pace, but Cabarsi saved his bacon, sliding in on what he recognized, that being Cabarsi was going to be a centering pass. Good job by the teenager here. 35th minute, Cabarsi with the header to keep the ball in the area, and Jao Felix was good with a fake that I just asked for, that opened up a shot that just unfortunately went wide, but this better from Jao Felix in a game that, once again, was not his best. Let's talk about Jao Felix another day, that's really my last note on him. Lamini Mall was a bit sloppy on the ball in the first half, but he was still putting in a shift defensively to win the ball. So I say that to you because I wrote that note, obviously, prior to the goal. We'll get to the goal later. But he wasn't having his best first half, but I still thought he was putting in a shift. And as I tell you even about Gundogan, when a player who has a potential or currently has, in Gundogan's case, top quality, even at their worst, they're able to contribute and deliver somebody to the game. And I was happy that Lamini Mall defensively was able to do that. Mark you, I thought almost a similar idea. He had the right idea with his hold-up play, but he was a bit too heavy with his feet on a few occasions. And I do think the lack of chemistry and the first time that Felix and Lamini Mall and Mark Yu were starting together, I thought that lack of chemistry and lack of understanding and movement off one another did not help Mark Yu because he's somebody that does thrive on that movement in behind and moving off the other forwards. And you weren't seeing too much of that with Jao Felix coming underneath him. So I do think that he was asked to do things in this match that were things that he knows how to do. And you'll see at youth levels, he does at a good level. But once he's getting to the first team as an 18-year-old, the questions that were asked of him physically, they're not there yet, and that's totally okay. So I really felt like it was a game that didn't necessarily fit him, even though the rotation wound up being important for Barcelona. So Mark you, that's my positive for him, that I think he did just fine with what he was given in this match. And yeah, there were some moments from him, but he's an 18-year-old striker. I'm totally fine with it. 37th minute, Fermi Lopez on for Rafinha, and Rafinha won the penalty, but no reward for Barcelona. And the good news being that Xavi did mention after the game that he doesn't believe that there's going to be an injury, that Rafinha should be available for Napoli, so that is all good news. 39th minute, Kubarsi tried an offside trap, the one mistake I had for Kubarsi in the entire game. But he got it wrong in that moment, and Mallorca had their best effort of the first half and wound up being the best effort of the game with a header that Ter Stegen had covered. It didn't help that Inigo Martinez kept losing the foot race either. That doesn't help in an offside trap when your other center back is consistently getting beat in a foot race by Laren. But on the next occasion, Martinez was able to put off Laren on another counter. So Barcelona, they were playing with fire, as they often do when the score is still 0-0, but they kept a clean sheet. I also thought, big picture-wise, Kubarsi, let's get into him, because I thought he was Barcelona's best player over the 90 minutes. And I'm glad that this game, and especially with kids playing, I'm glad this is one of those games where general consensus is okay. I don't need to galaxy brain this or anything like that. Lamine Mal and Kubarsi were Barcelona's two most impactful, let's say that, or most important players because of the way that this game wound up. I give a lot of credit to the zero to Gubarsi that Barcelona managed, and obviously so much of the credit on that one goal goes to Lamini Mall. For Gubarsi, here's his stats. One key pass, five accurate long balls, three of six on his ground duels, two of five on his aerial duels. But when you actually look at other center backs against Mariki, it's a very similar thing. Mariki is one of the best hold-up play and big body forwards in the Liga, so I'm going to be quite apologetic on that two of five aerial duels. But he also had five clearances, one block shot, three tackles, two recoveries, and a slide tackle in the box that really could have led to a penalty. We could be having a different conversation, but he has been so sharp and so smart 
With his tackles, I cannot say enough good things about Pau Cabarsi. 41st minute, first and went for Fermin Lopez. He dribbled past two and a through ball for Gundogan. Could have led to something, but goes right at the keeper. And Fermin Lopez also forced a save with a header on a delivery from Cancelo not long after. And I thought it was a really impressive response after the disappointing game by Fermin against Athletic Club. He had been so visually disappointed and cameras had caught it that Xavi, prior to the game in that presser, had said that Fermin Lopez was down, he was frustrated, and he wants to bounce back. And so I was happy with what Fermin Lopez added to that game after what was his most disappointing game in the shirt. So to bounce back, good on Fermin Lopez. Laminima also brought down Mariki before the half, but Mariki definitely dove and went down too easily. Jumping ahead to the second half here, 57th minute, Cancelo delivered a dangerous ball to the back post. Laminima hit the post on the follow-up, starting to percolate, even though he was still having one of his lesser games in a Barca uniform, and Rikovic got enough of it because that might have been underneath. I mean, maybe, I don't know how much of a hand he had on it, but the rebound, too much for Nico Martinez, though he also might have been offside anyway. And I guess I can even change this headline from three teenagers and Fermi Lopez to four teenagers, because in the 61st minute, Vitor Roque and Robert Lewandowski on for Jao Felix and Mark Yu. 67th minute, let's talk about Vitor Roque. He had good ball retention and dribbling out of trouble. Every time he does something with his feet like this in a movement and plays with confidence, these are all good signs for me. 69th minute, Vitor Roque had a header at the back post, and that's why Barcelona spent money on him to put the ball in the back of the net. The cross from Lewandowski, who looked fresh and looked important once he came on the game against the Mallorca side that had been defending for so much of the match, and I think that's a good reason why you saw more out of Lewandowski here. And that cross also came after Barca's best run of play in the second half. And while this is a topic probably better suited for the podcast, real quick on the Vitor Roque and Mark Yu minutes, there are people, especially on social media and the internet, that aren't going to be happy either way. Because if you start Mark Yu or give him minutes, well, what about Vitor Roque? You spent all that money. And if you start Vitor Roque, you say, oh, well, you don't want to lose Mark Yu. What a talent he is. And I think at this point, it's a weird situation that Barcelona's in. You can criticize them for going out and getting Vitor Roque. But as I remind you, he was supposed to show up in the summer. I don't know how many times I would say this. He was supposed to show up in the summer. Lewandowski is 35. There will be minutes and time and opportunities if both of them that being Vitor Roque and Mark Yu, are as good as they look at their ages of 19 and 18, then Barcelona will have enough space and time and opportunities for both of these players by the time they're not even in their prime, but they're 21, 22 years old, as long as they stay on this progression. Finding top-level quality forwards is really, really difficult, and both of these guys could be the right thing. So I'm not going to go crazy this season for either about saying, do they deserve minutes? How come they're not getting more minutes? Because Gu has been scoring goals everywhere. And I was happy to see him start because he deserves it. And Roque also deserves some minutes as he's slowly integrating with Barcelona's team. And even if Xavi doesn't like Vitor Roque, remember, he was bought for the future. And if he had come when he was supposed to, Xavi wouldn't be the manager. And Xavi has also shot down the idea about Vitor Roque and him not really favoring him or anything like that, just saying that it's taking a little bit after the injury he had in the Brazilian league and having played an entire Brazilian season, like I just kept warning everybody about, that it was going to take him a little bit physically to integrate himself into the squad. And over the next few weeks, there might be minutes for both of them, because while it does seem like Rafinha, as I said, was able to stave off injury, he still probably needed in midfield. So there might be some minutes for both of these guys, especially if Jao Felix can't earn 90 minutes, and Lamine Yamal, obviously, you'd love to bring him off the field when you possibly can Speaking of, headline for Lamine Yamal Dependencia. I'm also workshopping Lamine Dependencia, so I would love if you either put, if you're watching on YouTube in the comments below, or if you're listening on the podcast, DM me on Instagram or Twitter, or if you're a Patreon, let me know, message me there directly. Let me know, is it Lamine Dependencia or Lamine Yamal Dependencia? I want to make sure that the Barcelona podcast community jumps on this one early and we can claim it as our own, because we're talking about the goal here. 1-0, 73rd minute, leading up to it. Keep saying it, having one of his, which is a high standard, but one of his worst games, even though he already had a shot, hit the crossbar, we still call it one of his worst games at that point. But this goal, 95% Laminia Mall, brilliant from the kid, working with Kunde there on the right, who continues to be solid. And that is what you want Kunde to be at right back, solid. Another solid day for Kunde, good on him. Lewandowski was also stronger than Gu had been, Gets it back to Lamine Mall after that movement that they had on the right side. And Lamine Mall here, so good, creates the angle with a little dribble forward, cuts it back, and delivers a curling shot that is so good that the keeper knew it was in as it was still in the air. No chance for Rikovic. He was stuck on his line. This, I think, is the best goal of his young career. And as I said, it comes on the backdrop of one of his worst games in a shirt so far. 
individual brilliance when you aren't at your best is the mark of a player capable of being the best. I'm not saying Lillet Minimal is the best, but that thing that you're seeing, I saw the same thing with Alexi Buteus with the women's team, the same thing with Aitana Banmati, where they might be having a ho-hum game, and then all of a sudden, in a moment, yes, usually a goal is the way this works, but you score a goal out of nothing just because you're a brilliant player. Lamine Mall is already doing that at 16. I have to put the brakes on the things I have to say about Lamine Mall because I'm going to run out of things to say by the time he turns 17, and hopefully we've got a decade plus of saying good things about him. And headline five is get the points. Christensen went the full 90 for the first time in his seven games as a defensive midfielder, which I hope is a good sign. Or Romeo instead came in for the final few minutes for Gundogan to just shut everything down. And I like also late in that game that Barcelona kept going for another goal. Lewandowski was unfortunate to not get the call on a penalty. He went down a bit easily, maybe, but the contact was there. And it is kind of unfortunate because he had landed with his left instead of kind of hopping into the ground. And then he went down after he landed and planted on his left. He probably does get the call there. But going down on the hop made the ref suspect of a bit of a dive and where was momentum going. So he doesn't get the call and VAR didn't see enough to overturn it. And at the end of that match, let's talk about the clean sheet. Because just imagine yourself at the start of the season. And I tell you that Barca got a clean sheet with 17-year-old Pau Cubarsi, who had just been promoted to Juvenil A from Cadet A, that Inigo Martinez, the new signing, and Cancelo playing at left back. That trio was playing at the back, and Barcelona got a clean sheet. You'd probably be surprised to hear that, and also be asking what the heck happened to all the other players, obviously. But for a defense that has been poor, for them to get a clean sheet in the way that they did, I have very few complaints. Also part of that clean sheet, even though he didn't have much to do, was Ter Stegen, who sits just behind Victor Valdez in goalkeeper appearances at the club, as this was number 400 for the German keeper. A few years ago, I did have him in the top 50 of Barcelona players ever, even at that point for me. And that big number is a little vindication. I put him in the top 50 on the back of two of his best seasons in a Barcelona uniform. But even though this season hasn't been his best, you look at last season as well. I do think it is now pretty clear cut that it's Victor Valdez, it's Ter Stegen, then it's Zubi Zaretta. Then we're talking about Ramayets and Plotko. And that's pretty much the goalkeepers you need to talk about when you're speaking about FC Barcelona. The big picture from this match with so many gosh darn injuries, Napoli on Tuesday, now, this is one of those games that you get the points, you hear the whistle blow, and you say, thank goodness, three points, you did the job. This was not going to be a statement game just because of Mallorca. And yeah, they made a Copa del Rey final, but even if you get a 3 nothing result, people will just throw it away as Mallorca. So get what you need to get, get out. You lost Rafinha in the game. Fortunately, you didn't lose him for longer. You started Mark Yu instead of Lewandowski, no Araujo, no Xavi on the touchline. So I am fine that Barcelona didn't light the world on fire with this performance. The team is also still without a loss since Xavi announced his departure. And with only two more months, in theory, of Xavi in charge, we already know this team is lacking ideas as a unit. They're likely not going to pick up any new ideas. Chris Sinnott, Sinnott, defensive midfielder, has been something to watch, of course. But they are a team that still, even with the goal by Lamine Mall, relies on individual brilliance. And this game wasn't changing that, certainly from minute one all the way to minute 90. It was the same old story, but fortunately for Barcelona, they were the better team at home got the three points, so I'm happy with it in preparation for Napoli where we got some ideas of what not necessarily we're going to see, but fortunately, Xavi was able to rotate his team before Napoli, and I'm interested to see the 11 that he throws out for that one. Now, you're not going to be hearing from me until after the Napoli match, but I do plan on whatever happens, breaking down all of that with both a five headlines and then a podcast soon after that, of course. So if you don't want to miss any of that, of course, subscribe to the YouTube channel or subscribe on any of the podcast apps that you have this in your ears for, including the Patreon where you can hear the show without the ads. And as always, until next time, Forza Barca.